Welcome to Velocity Radio. Stone Payton, J.R. McNair, and Lee Cantor here with you this afternoon. This is going to be a fantastic segment. we got a studio full. I am so excited about getting this off the ground. Welcome, Mr. J.R. McNair. Thanks so much, Stone. Listen, I'm excited to be here with you and Lee and all the rest of the crew today. We're going to have a good time. Get everybody uh, uh, tuned in. Uh, what do you think about that, Lee? I'm excited. Uh, I was excited. Now I'm more excited. There we go. <laughs> and uh, you got a full house for the first episode. It's going to be an exciting adventure we're all on. Well, you know what? We wanted to make sure when we uh, when I did this particular show on the studio that I got some people in here that – uh, some people that I've known for a while, some people that I've uh, met recently, but just some people that I thought had um, varied uh, aspects of their business that are really doing some impactful things in, in the Atlanta area. And I just wanted to talk about them. Yeah. And I think it, it shows kind of a 360 view of business in Atlanta. So they touch on a, a bunch of different facets of Atlanta. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, Atlanta is uh, a little bit of everything. It's a, I wouldn't say a hodgepodge, but it's kind of, it's got a little bit of everything from all different uh, aspects and regions and um, different industries. And I think all of these guests have, with their background and their experience, just have a great, great look into um, a snapshot of the city. So, and uh, who'd you bring with you today? Well, I, I have uh, with me Lisa Lede Davis of Kennesaw CPA. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome. Yes, yes. And I have Mr. Kenneth Igwe of Baker Collins. Good afternoon, guys. Yes. And um, last but not least, I have Miss Jacqueline Waller of Standing Room Events. Good afternoon. Yes, most definitely. All right. So who do you want to uh, kick off the show with? We're going to kick off the show with Lisa. I'm going to um I'm I'm excited um um for um uh, for everybody and I'm going to I'm going to talk about even more um while I'm even uh, excited about Lisa uh towards the uh, end of her segment but um you know I've known Lisa now for uh for some years and and we have um had an opportunity to help a lot of small businesses and companies organizations all throughout uh the uh pretty much the southeast it's not just in Atlanta so and um I wanted to uh, kind of just uh bring Lisa on she's somebody that I trust in the space uh, for what she does in um the financial more of the con- consul uh consultative uh financial uh, uh analysis and uh CPA work that she does um uh, Lisa is uh did a, a a ton of stuff in actually um uh, Omaha and so, uh, Lisa, I, I, I'm going to stop talking for a little. I just want to tell them, like, because your background, you're from Louisiana. You're in, you were in Omaha. Now you're in Atlanta. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> well, it, it is a bit of a journey. I actually went from Louisiana to Atlanta. I was here a couple of years when the, uh, the, um, the Olympics was here. Mm-hmm. And so I was here for a couple of years, spent about 15 years in the Midwest, in Omaha, Nebraska, and then back to Georgia again the last four to five years. So I'm excited to be back. Yeah. You know, we're excited for you to be back. And you and you've launched um, one of the fastest growing CPA firms in Metro Atlanta. Kennesaw CPA. Could you say, talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, that was exciting that we, when I came back here, um, most of my career, I've worked with small to medium sized businesses. I've been a CPA for over 20 years and worked in the insurance industry and the risk management industry. And um, even one of the companies we were with was recognized by SBA as being a champion for small businesses. So I know I wanted to continue that work with small to medium sized businesses and helping to the success of those businesses. Cause the solopreneurs, the entrepreneurs, the small business owners, that's the wave of the future. That's where we're going um, as far as the development in our economy here. And we want to kind of contribute to that success. So it was really exciting to start Kennesaw CPA, especially here in the Atlanta metro area, and then give an opportunity to put some services in place, some tools in place that's going to help those business owners be successful. Most definitely. And you you said um, uh, some services and tools. Now, who I want you to talk about because uh, you had an opportunity also to go through our accelerator uh, velocity um, last year. And um, and and it was phenomenal. And in that you were able to develop a a new uh, a business, but also a great tool. Could you talk about what that tool is? You know, one of the things we did when we worked with your accelerator program is that 
we knew some of the problems and the issues that business owners faced as far as not having enough time, money, resources, wearing multiple hats. We're going, what can we put in place to kind of alleviate some of that pressure? We can't be everything to everyone. So, but we know we can be strong in that financial aspect or the financial management aspect. So that's when we developed the tax guide. And while the name is the tax guide, it's so much more than just tax services and tax planning. We actually put in place a subscription-based service that's effective and affordable for small business owners. It allows them to pay a monthly fee and have unlimited access to an accounting team, consultant, to be able to implement the things that's needed in their business, like budgeting, planning. And then when all that is said and done, they still have the tax preparation at the end of the year that's automatically included. They have the accounting software that's just uh, instr- instrumental to the success of the management of their business. That's automatically covered in the software. We help them get set up. We make sure that they're managing their business financially all year long. And then at the end of the year and even quarterly, we're able to do effective tax planning with them to make sure that they're paying minimal taxes uh, and making the best use of their business funds. That is awesome. You know, one, before the uh, show, I was talking with uh, Jacqueline. I was telling her about um, uh, uh, Legal Shield. They have a membership every month where you pay and you get, uh, you can call into attorneys and things like that. Um, and but this is with n- nothing against attorneys, but you know, I, I think I need. I, I'm a, I, I would be pressed, you know, to make sure I have somebody that I can call every time about my financial problems. You know, and that's one of the things that we encourage when we first start working with a business owner is make sure you have that team of trusted advisors around you. There should include some legal, there should be some marketing, there should be some accounting. But what we put in place by having that program is the access to sit down. I, we tell everyone you should always manage your company financially each month. But you should also meet and at minimally with your trusted advisors quarterly to get that outside input on what's going on with your business, making sure you're getting the information to make the right decisions with your business to be mobile, to be nimble, to make those adjustments, uh, to put the best practices in place when it comes to your financials and then make the decisions that's going to impact your tax ultimately. So, yeah, most definitely. So in. Over the 20 years, you've been doing uh, CPA work for 20 years, right? Yes. And so over that 20 years, you've seen a ton of companies, right? We have. We have. We've seen some uh, succeed. We've seen some fail. Uh, we, what we try to learn is a lesson from each one of those engagements to figure out how we can help make the next company better every time. So I know probably this is one of the biggest questions you probably get in your space because you've seen so many businesses over these 20 years. What, you know, and we know over a 15 uh, year uh, period that 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of small businesses fail within that time frame. So if, if they started out as 100 businesses, um, only uh, uh, 10 to 20 of them are left um, at the end of that time. What have you seen has been a, like a, 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 a couple of problems or maybe a number one thing that you've seen that's caused the, the demise of those companies? I think if you look at the national data when they talk about those statistics and how businesses uh, succeed or fail, if you look at the top five reasons, at least three of them are going to be financial related. And so that was why we stayed with that focus of financial management of the business. But even beyond that, I think a lot of it has to do with, again, the team, the advisors that they put in place. It's very difficult when you start a business and you're kind of a one man show and you're wearing all these hats and you're having to be an expert in so many areas. Having those teams of, uh, of different experts in different places that will help you make those decisions and help you identify some of the issues early on so you can be proactive instead of reactive, making sure you have the appropriate cash flow, knowing when your business is going to break even, when does it need resources or capital, when it doesn't. Just having those planning processes in place is going to do, uh, it's going to take that business a lot further in, in their chances of success. Okay. Definitely. And so if we're looking at, um, just all the different you have cash flow statements and all of what would be a a, a, a main uh, a tool or something a financial statement that I as a business owner that any business owner should look at first if they're a small business and they're running what would be that one thing that they need to be keeping their eyes on consistently you know it's hard to narrow it down to one thing because they're they're going to need all those financials at some point in the process be that the income statement uh, still known as the profit and loss or the balance sheet. But when it comes to managing your business and planning and budgeting, there's nothing like the cash flow statement to take your business, 
know what your your future is going to look like on a one-year basis, a three-year basis, a five-year basis. We even tell people, make a 20-year plan. The 20-year plan doesn't have to have detailed financials, but you need to know where you're going with your business, what your ultimate goal is and what you want to be because it will affect so many decisions along the way. But definitely having that cash flow tool that you can manage and uh, compare your actual operations to the planned operations and do that comparison each month to see where you're falling short, see where you need to make adjustment, any changes in your marketing plan, your, your, your spending, knowing where your dollars are going. That is key for a business is cash flow. So using that on an ongoing basis in the planning with your business. And, uh, you know, speaking about planning, your business has just, you know, I believe it's exploded over the time that it's been uh, here in Atlanta when you've opened up uh, this operation here. Where do you see yourself over the next few years, over the next four or five years, just from a, you know, what success? What does that success look like? Now you really put me on the spot there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's hard to say. I'm uh, I'm very hands on, mm-hmm. which is uh, sometimes my downfall because I want to be so engaged and involved in the process. Sure. So it's really what every other small business owner uh, struggles with is figuring out how to scale my business to help the most people that we can, mm-hmm. but still having the the resources in place, the quality of service. So that's what we're building. We're looking at different options as far as technology, different recommendations and process that we can put in place so we can help more people but still maintain the same quality of service that we started with being with that one-on-one service most definitely because i'm gonna tell you like you know the the biggest thing i i I refer almost everybody i know to you know and and i do that because you know there there were not a lot of people that are in in the space that understand not all accountants or CPAs are created equal, right? And uh, you know, you just think that if people they come in the space, oh I have a CPA, I have somebody that does my taxes, but it's like they might not have that information. One of the things that I love about you is that you have a breadth of knowledge because I've trained lawyers, accountants, people over the years, and I'm like, man, you know, they should understand some of these basic fundamentals. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, how, how, did you come out of school having that information, or is it something that you developed in time? I mean, what what's the difference? What what made you be different than some of these other accountants that I run into on a, on a consistent basis. You know, I think it's because when, you know, when I first got started, I started my career in tax and audit and all those other things. But when I got to the middle part of my career, I focused more on the risk management side okay. and it gave me a different aspect t- t- of go, looking, go helping with a the small bit business. Deeper so with, with risk that. management, we, uh, we actually worked with small businesses. We did a couple of different programs. One was insurance based where we look at the different risk and exposures of associated with the business and how to properly manage that either through insurance or financial management of it. But another aspect is we used to work with small and disadvantaged contractors, helping them get and bid on work with uh, public officials and city and counties and things like that. So working one-on-one with those individuals that, you know, some of them are one-man show, some of them had, you know, 10 contractors on staff, and looking at the different challenges they're faced, not just on the financial side, but just throughout their business, and then coming up with solutions put in place to help them be able to get, bid that work, successfully complete that work, and then make it profitable for them, and watching all those challenges. So I think it's just kind of the breadth of a a variety of experiences that I've had over the 20 years. Okay. Okay. And so in that, would you, I I want you to answer two questions for me. Number one, what is the biggest thing you think you did in your business that has really like helped push it to the next level? And then what was the one thing in your business that probably was, Hey, you know, maybe one of your biggest mistakes. (laughs) Uh, I'll start with my biggest mistake. I think one of my biggest mistakes was the, the waiting to get this piece started. Yeah. I, I wish I would have started this 10 years ago because yeah. there's no telling where we would have been and just the, the, the impact we could have made doing that. That's right. Um, so one of my biggest mistakes was just not getting started sooner. And then, um, as far as, you know, what we recognize as the biggest gain, I think, you know, one of our, um, most admirable moments is when we got recognized by the Small Business Administration as being a champion for small businesses. I mean, that is our goal. That is what we want to impact. I mean, I'd like to say, you know, 20 years from now that we're talking in the millions of numbers of businesses that we've impacted um, in their success and the future of their business just by the programs and the software and the tools that we've put in place. Well, you know what? I, 
you know, I, I kind of uh, cheered up some when you said the millions. Because I, I have I remember, to say millions because yeah. if I say thousands, you'd fall out of your chair. Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> right. Because, you know, we always talk about going bigger, mm-hmm. better, reaching, you know, changing the world. And, and that's one of the things. And I, and I love that you are in a position now because a lot of people have the passion but don't have the capacity to fulfill. Because you might have the, all the passion in the world to want to help people, but you just don't have the infrastructure or the capacity to even – fulfill upon maybe that large vision that you have yeah so i think that's great and you know one of the things i wanted to say i um you know and i and i think it is good to talk about it now this kind of leads into really this next phase of 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 lisa of kennesaw cpa of the tax guide and everything is the show that you're going to be uh launching next week right well that that's how we're going to uh, start that journey to being able to help millions of businesses is that we're going to focus on highlighting and spotlighting uh businesses in georgia businesses nationally offering resources i'm really excited about that opportunity to be able to work one-on-one with so many businesses well yeah, t- tell me a little bit about tell me the name of the show and tell me uh, uh what you're going to be talking about in the show well right now i think we're going to call it the georgia small business business financial hour. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk to local businesses. We're going to talk about some of their challenges. We're going to talk about some recommendations that we have for them right there on the show. Some of the tools that are out there, technology, things that they can put in place that will help their business. And then um, just from the feedback that we're getting, talk about the development of things that can be put in place to help businesses in the future as well. Most definitely. Most definitely. So who would be a good uh, ideal uh, uh, guest to come on your show? You know, one of the things uh, I really like working with is businesses that have been in business, say, about three and five years. Mm -hmm. And when you start off as a small business, you know, you start off usually as the one man show. You've grown your team. You've gotten there. But now you're having that challenge of getting to the next level or scaling that business. And that's where you can really see the impact of some of the tools and the trades and things that we can put in place. So we'd like to talk to those businesses that are at that stage. Well, listen, I'm excited. I'm excited and I'm ready for you to do it. And, uh, you, I know you're going to tear it up. And, uh, I, I know, uh, I know Lee, uh, what, what, t- t- tell me, your, tell me what you think about that, Lee. Well, I think it was right on point. And like you said, all CPAs aren't created equal. There are some that care more, that do more and that serve more. And Lisa, you're a great example of that. Thank you. Now, if somebody wanted to learn more about your practice, is there a website? Sure. They should visit uh, www.kennesawcpa.com or they can go to thetaxguide.com. Um, either website will direct you. You'll get information, uh, direct you to our email address, phone number, address, all of that information. Good stuff. Well, congratulations for all the success. All right. Thank you. Most definitely. Well, listen, you know, we're going to keep this train rolling and keep it going. And I'm so excited to talk to our next guest because it's kind of a direct lead in, you know, you setting up the foundation of your business, making sure your business is right. But but one of the biggest indicators over my career as a consultant, the thing that I've seen that people have always asked uh, the number one thing is, hey, how do I get money? How do I get funding? You know, it's like, I need money. And so, and, 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 you know, I had the uh, opportunity to meet Kenneth at, um, at, um, Corey Moore's event. Uh, uh Corey does a lot of e- events in Atlanta and, and I always try to come and support. And, I, uh, Kenneth, as soon as I walked in the door, uh, and, and Corey said, listen, I need you to beat this guy. <laughs> and so, and so we, he, he walks me over there and I say, okay, and I, and I understood it with really within the first couple minutes why he wanted us to introduce Kenneth Igwe of Baker Collins, and they do some amazing work. Kenneth, tell 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 the the audience what you, what you do and, and and why you do it. Sure. So we are a private money lender for real estate investors. We finance residential as well as commercial real estate investors all over the southeast. And as of November 1st, all over, over the next 41 states, wow. uh, we realized that a lot of folks were having um, very challenging times trying to access the capital markets. And so we decided to kind of put a form together to allow individuals to kind of take take advantage of that. So on the residential side, we're the guys who will finance the uh, renovation projects, the new construction projects, the properties where folks want to actually hold on to them, as well as lines of credit for some very experienced investors. On the commercial side, we'll finance office uh, buildings, retail buildings, um, uh, uh, industrial parks, as well as hospitality, a.k.a. hotels. 
as well. And so we we created because a lot of individuals were essentially having those challenges trying to kind of figure out who do they find or how do they access the capital because that's one of the most intimidating things as far as getting into real estate investing. Where do you find the money? How do you go about doing this? And so I think that's one of the reasons – that's why Baker Columns was born uh, as well. I, I, I was telling you the uh, first time I, lo- I love that name Baker Collins. It just sound, <laughs> it sounds like it's been out for about fifty years, maybe a hundred years. Well, you know we haven't been out around that long. Yeah, we yeah. we were we started back in twenty fifteen, okay. um, and uh, it was actually born because it was the name of two of my college professors. They passed on now, and oh, they wow. allowed me to kind of really think bigger about um, just doing bigger deals and think about. I fell in love with finance when I went through their classes. And so I just kind of wanted to give homage to them. And that's how it kind of came about as well. Speaking of Mm -hmm. uh, professors, Mm -hmm. was this at Harvard? Or was this at where you, you tell, (laughs) tell me, tell me about where you went to school at and and the different schools that you went to. So I was supposed to be a doctor. Um, That didn't work out well because I didn't like to sign up the side of blood. Okay. Uh, So, you know, I was always good at math. So kind of segued into engineering. I came here, uh, went, did a um, uh, dual degree, with at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia Tech, got a math degree at Morehouse, got an electrical engineering degree at Georgia Tech. Um, ultimately, kind of found my way into finance. I actually love um, I, I love real estate. And I love finance. I was trying to figure out how do I kind of intersect the two, and so I ended up uh, as a commercial investment banker and did a master's degree at Harvard University as well. So these invest these two professors were at Morehouse and uh, Georgia Tech. Oh wow, mm-hmm. wow. So. And um, so could you could you just briefly kind of touch on those two professors? And Yeah. Yeah. So one of them was an economics professor. I, I you know, as an engineering student, you know, I was always interested and really, really cons- um, just intrigued as to how finance worked. And so they were able to kind of share with me books um, about how finance works, such as the, the Preacher Jekyll Island. Um, they also shared with me books. They they actually gave me the book Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad Poor Dad, which kind of really changed my my mind and how I thought about how finance works and how just creation of wealth works as well. Um, in addition to, they shared with me kind of one of the things you can really think about going into was real estate. And so here I was, a young 19, 20-year-old individual. I was destined to be a great engineer. And once I got into their classes, I was just like, you know what, I'm probably uh, – obviously my first – a job out of college was with IBM, um, spent for about a year for there. And then from there, we decided to just start renovating some properties and uh, renovated two properties two years out of college and never really looked back. Um, just been in real estate ever since from there as well. That's mm-hmm. amazing, man. You know, I, I don't know if you knew, I um, I got, I had, I was a, a kid watching an infomercial when I was like yeah. 12 mm-hmm. and then I had got a, uh, a guy's name was Russ Whitney learned yes. all yes. this information yes. from him mm-hmm. and I bought a piece of real estate when I was like 14 it wasn't a house it was just a piece of land but That's it was impressive yeah it was in some land in a gated mm-hmm. community out in West Georgia mm-hmm. and um and that that's amazing man you know real estate has produced more millionaires than any other profession on the planet yeah talk 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 a little bit about um the field you know just in general mm-hmm. Well, so one of the things, the reason why we do what we do is because we're looking to help investors create and preserve wealth um, through real estate investing. And so a lot of individuals will get into this business and they will try to create wealth, but then they tend to forget how to you preserve wealth. So to preserve wealth, there are certain things that you need to do. Um, we'll show them, okay, you definitely want to hire a CPA like Lisa. Uh, you want to hire a financial advisor. You want to hire those folks, but you also want to invest in other projects as well, such as long-term holds, maybe invest in a multifamily project. Project. So our biggest source of revenue currently is fix and flips. So we've all seen the shows um, on A and E and HDTV. No promotion or in, for those shows or anything of that sort. <laughs> um, again, I have a love. Let me not go into that. I, I, I like the fact that they are encouraging a ton of individuals to get into real estate investing, and they've been the catalyst to allow folks to start to believe I can do this. This is doable. Um, sometimes with some of those shows, they tend to give an unrealistic view as to how renovation um, goes. Entertainment, it's right? Inter- there's an entertainment <laughs> value there. But I really encourage folks to get into this and learn more about it because it really allows folks to really change the trajectory of their family lineage if they can. Um, because now you can create a skill set that allows you to generate wealth and generate capital for you and your family. And also you can have multiple assets that allow you to keep generating passive income so therefore you can really attain the American dream, which is what we all deem as well. Most definitely. Mm -hmm. 
So if I'm trying to get into real estate Mm -hmm. and if I come to you, do I need to already have real estate before I come to you? Not at all. Okay. So, and, and then, um, so, so I don't need to have, and so does my credit have to be like super good or Mm -hmm. it has to be really good? Not necessarily. So that's, again, one of the things that we do that really delineates us from other folks is we like to train and we like to uh, make certain that our investors really understand what they're getting themselves into. So we actually will do, we have a shameless plug. We actually have, uh, we trained a ton of investors. We have a free class and we also have a CE class, okay. a continuing education class. And we tell people, this is what you need to do to get into real estate investing. You do not need to have perfect credit. You do not need to have a boatload of cash. You do not need to have um, a ton of experience. Um, although those things are great and those things are things that we would definitely see as a plus, they're not a requirement. And so one of the things we like to do is really dispel a lot of the myths and a lot of the false narratives that tend to surround our industry because there are a lot of them. And so we want people to really understand how to go about using private money to acquire and maintain real estate assets. That is awesome. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So what is there a minimum in, in to get into it? Is there a max? Um, sure. So I'm going to give you a very technical answer. Okay. It depends. Okay. <laughs> um, and I find myself saying that a lot, especially I, I can say it in so many ways now. Yeah. Theoretically, possibly that may be the case. And so – Typically, it depends on the institution that you go to. So for us, our minimum loan amount is $50,000 uh, for residential. For residential, our maximum loan amount is $2.5 million. Uh, now, as it relates to commercial, our minimum loan amount is 250000 and our maximum loan amount is $25 million. So it really depends on the individual, their experience, their credit. Uh, we will take a look at those things, but it's not a requirement for them to start investing or start utilizing our capital for them as well. Yeah, you know, um, and and this is uh, maybe a um, um, we have a container home business, and we okay. make shipping container homes, and so we have developers come to us all the time. As a matter of fact, we had a uh, person just right outside the studio was uh, say, "Hey, man, you know, I got approved for three hundred. You know, I'm, you know, hey, how can I get this going? I mean, what, what kind of, you know, we thought that our number one audience base was going to be first time homebuyers, actually investors, developers. Mm-hmm. Um, what, why did you go after and that, that them being your primary audience base instead of, uh, did it just happen or? Well, I had a background in real estate and I had a background in finance. So it just kind of made sense to kind of connect the two and figure out, okay, how can I add the most value to investors? How can I add the most, what group of individuals or business owners can I add the most value to? Can we add the most value to? And so we identified it would be real estate investors who were looking to get into these projects, whether it was a renovation project or a new construction project or someone who wanted to hold on to an asset for an extended time frame. Uh, that's fine. Um, But one of the things we like to do is really make certain that people get to understand what they're getting themselves into. Because at the end of the day, you are incurring debt. And if you're incurring debt, you have to be very knowledgeable about it. You have to understand the pros as well as the cons. You have to understand all the tenants around this particular uh, transaction. And so we want people to understand that. But we felt that we could add the most value to individuals who are looking to – get into a fix and flip or get into a rental loan or get into some type of asset they were looking to kind of hold on to as well. Most definitely. So mm-hmm. do you do a lot of speaking at different events or? I have. I have. This year I've done a good amount of speaking. I've been on a couple of shows as well. Um, it's interesting and I, I love doing it because um, we really get to share with people what we do. This is kind of an esoteric industry, meaning that a lot of people are not familiar with what we do. They so, have a lot of uh, misinformation and they don't even know that we exist. So we're the group that will actually finance the deals that the typical bank will not finance because of their risky deals. I mean, most banks, if you walk into, and they're all great institutions, Chase, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, all very venerable institutions, uh, they will typically not finance a property that is dilapidated, needs a ton of work, and you're going to sell it for some price in the future that you really can't pinpoint yet. So that's a ton of risk for them. They want to lend money to projects that are have limited risk, move-in ready, rent ready. Um, things are going to give them a really good return on their investment now. We don't mind taking on that risk. So we will do those deals, and we'll do them. We, these are the deals we do all day long in multiple markets also. Wow. And so how does it typically work? I mean, could you walk us through like, a, you know, if I come today, how long that takes? Sure. What, you know, the, you know, the... I don't know the 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 average uh, uh time that it takes to do that or the, the maybe the 
um, uh, um, the the percentages of approvals sure. or. Sure. So um, as it relates to renovation loans, we have to move very fast. Um, in Atlanta, specifically to real estate investing, this is a hyper-competitive market. So you're not just competing with Atlanta investors. You're also competing with statewide investors as well as national investors, and we have a number of international clients. So we have to move with speed. We typically close our renovation loans within 10 to 14 days. Uh, we tend to get our borrowers qualified within 24 to 48 hours. If they have a property – we're going to get them out a proof of funds letter based off the information they provided to us. Um, once they provided that um, information to us, then they can go out and start shopping. If they can provide us with an executed contract plus a renovation budget that makes sense to us, we're going to go ahead and order the appraisal, inspection, title work, things of that sort. Our hope is all those items come back within maybe three to five days from the time that we ordered it for us to be able to close within that 10 to 14 day time frame. So as it relates to 10 to renovation loans, we move really, really quickly because we have to, and we need our borrowers to be, uh, to be successful. It's not a want, it's a need. And because when we deploy capital, we have to make certain that we're deploying it to individuals who are properly educated as to how this process works. So yeah, that's kind of, um, how we work in a nutshell for renovation loans. Now, for a rental scenario, it does take a little bit more time because we're looking at a little bit more information, um, but it's still it's still a little faster than your traditional bank. And as a private money lender, we're pretty flexible with underwriting. So we're not looking at your income. We're not looking at your employment. Um, a lot of our investors do not provide taxes. Uh, we don't necessarily need to see that. We base our decision on the strength of the deal. If the deal makes sense and if the borrower has um, can provide evidence of liquidity, that's the deal that we'll finance. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's amazing, man. You you need to be everywhere. I'm talking about <laughs> – I'm serious. I'm, I'm serious. I was speaking at uh, Savannah Real Estate, mm-hmm. um, the RIA down there, and the Real Estate Investors Association. That's one of the biggest things yeah. that um, everybody's looking for. Mm-hmm. Man, we need to definitely get you um, out there. And now you said you're in 41 states Correct. and you have – Cumulative experience of like a hundred years. Mm-hmm. T- tell me a little bit about that. So here in Atlanta, we have five account executives. Okay. Um, we have a, a co- processor, a couple of virtual assistants. We have a executive assistant in Atlanta, in Houston. We have another office as well. And so between the mortgage brokers who work for us, uh, the realtors. Um, our uh, directors and things of that sort, our partners. Cumulatively, we have about exceeding 100 years of experience. Wow. Uh, so there aren't a lot of deals that we have not taken a look at as it relates to private money, um, whether it's residential, whether it's commercial. Um, I don't want to tune our own horn, but we've seen a lot, and it's be rare if something if it's something that we feel that we can't do as well. So I'm going to ask you the same question also. Sure. You know, in, the, in these years you've been in business mm-hmm. and all these things and, you know, with all your education background, and just from start to finish, it can be something in college, it can be something in your business, what has been the biggest mistake that you've made in your company or in in life, you mm-hmm. know, and then your biggest gain? I mean, your biggest success moment that you would say. So I'm going to do exactly what Lisa did as far as starting with my mistakes. Um, I didn't hire fast enough. Um, okay. One of the things I we started off as a two person operation back in 2015. And we were doing okay. You know, it was a great time to be a real estate investor. It was a great time to be in lending. And we didn't realize that we could scale the business much faster if we would have put some pieces in place that allowed us to really scale and put certain processes and systems in place to allow us to do what we do now. Um, So that's one of our biggest – I would say that's one of our biggest early on mistakes. Um, One of my biggest successes, one of the company's biggest successes was being able to be granted that CE accreditation. Um, for us to teach people how to utilize private money in pretty much all over the state of Georgia, and we're working on getting that accreditation in other states, that's humongous to me. Because what that does is that lets people, we can now share with people how to do this correctly. We stay in our lane. We just lend money. We don't want to do anything else outside of that. We don't want to find a property for our borrowers. We don't want to show them how to dispossess of these properties. We just want to lend money, and we want to show them exactly how to go about doing it correctly. So to be able to offer that to real- realtors and individuals and show them how they can use renovation loans and um, rental projects and um, new construction projects – and really, especially for realtors, really expand their investor base and then expand their client base. To me, it was one of our biggest successes. Um, 
you know, that's the first one I'll, I'll share with you. Another one, we were able to get into those 41 states now. So we've expanded our pool of capital. So therefore, we can deploy to more investors and help a lot of investors out also. That's great. So mm-hmm. in, in now that you're in 41 states, mm-hmm. I mean, are you trying to expand in all the 50? Are you going to stay in the... Are we're going to stay in the 50 for now. I of mean, the 41, 41 for now. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. And so over the next years, I mean, what's the... Um, is this a national brand? Yeah, yeah. So our goal is to have um, boots on the ground in pretty much 50% of the states that we lend in. Okay. And um, currently we have boots on the ground in Georgia and Texas. I'm originally from Houston. Um, but the goal is to be able to be in at least 20, 24 to 25 of those states within the next five years. Um, you know, we're, we're working towards that and uh, we're just kind of figure we're working on improving certain systems and processes to allow us to go about doing that. But currently we are able to lend in those 41 states. That's great. Mm-hmm. So how can somebody find out about you or your company? Sure. So they can go to our website, um, www.bakercollins.com. Fairly simple. Again, it's www.bakercollins.com or they can call our office at 770-988-4537. Most definitely. Mm-hmm. That's great. So what you, what you think? You, you need some money? Right. Now I know I got a guy. You know, yeah, everybody's exactly. got to have a guy. Everybody's got to have that guy. <laughs> or gal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so who are you going to close the show with? Hey, Who's the headliner? Uh, we're going to mm-hmm. close it with Jackie. We, you know what? I, I, we had an opportunity to go get some, 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 some grub at a, um, was it Noodle? And uh, in uh, in Atlanta, it was good. It was good. Got some noodles, right? So, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so, uh, yeah, we're gonna have uh, Miss Waller go ahead and, and talk to the wonderful people about her company, Standing Room Events. You know, uh, we just had an opportunity to launch, do that uh, um, launch event last week in Buckhead, right? Last Thursday at Yep Doraku Sushi. Yeah, yep. most definitely, most definitely. Um, tell me about. You know, first let's get let's talk a little bit about the launch and um, you know what your main objective of that was, and then I want you to just kind of get into really talking about the company and why you started it. Okay, so we did the launch because we are standing room events and we do marketing and event consulting. So what better way to launch our company except with a launch event, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the goal was to invite some friends and prospective customers out to show them what we could do and for us to come together and network and uh, have an opportunity just to really kind of introduce ourselves. Uh, we did some speaking from the event as well uh, and taught about, uh, you know, marketing your events, hosting your events, and the best way to follow up after driving your brand. Most definitely. So when you <clears> – <throat> I, I met you at one of our events. Correct. And when you were hosting. When I was hosting an event and, and you came in and you said, I help business owners, um, cre- do events that, you know, they could have their own and pull. Cause that was the reason why I got into doing events when I started because I was like, you know what? I have this information, but who knows? Nobody. Right. <laughs> you know? So I said, and I went reaching out to different places and, and they were like, well, okay, well, Come back next year or whatever. And I was like, cause they didn't know me either. So I said, I'll do my own event. Right. And that's what got uh, me in the event game. Um, what was your story like? So first of all, let me just say that I'm not an event planner, although I can put a business organized event together. Um, but we help with the branding, marketing part of that. And then also the right way to put it together to drive clients and to lifelong customers. But I started out a number of years ago uh, with a company called Connecting Atlanta. Um, so we have, just like a group on Facebook, started a networking company, um, started networking events, and then always had like an educational person come out that I felt like could add value back to the business owners. And then we just ended up flipping it and we decided to do business workshops. 72 business workshops later... Um, we put those together with bringing out speakers. 72. 72, yeah. Okay, so I put that, on 72. that's a lot of events. That's a lot of events. Yeah, we did about two a month. So that was marketing it. We partnered with companies like the SBA Score here in Atlanta, um, as well as uh, Pro Networker, which is Corey Moore's company. And we would promote each other's events. So that was one of the biggest things I learned was 
uh, partnering with other organizations that are like minded businesses and be able to drive uh, individuals back to yourself. And then also working with the right speakers that had nice marketing lists themselves and knew how to email their clients out. So, yeah. So why would I, as a customer, why should I put on events or why is it important? Well, uh, what you had mentioned earlier was, um, you know, there's a lot of CPAs. There's a lot of honey, hard money lenders. There's a lot of, um, uh, banks like financial institutions, whatever, real estate agents that there's like, if you go onto Eventbrite, you'll see a ton of like home buying seminars, right? But why should I spend my time going and how do I A, know who to pick and B, why should I spend my time going to learn what they have to say unless they're going to be having that added value? Like he has education back for investors, right? And she does a lot of other high knowledge in helping out her clients, not just saying, okay, we'll do your accounting, but there's a lot of other added value that she adds back, right? Which is makes sense why you're going to do the radio show and, um, and so forth. So that's one of the reasons why people should do events because it helps stand them out. Mm -hmm. And it also says, okay, if I come to your event, whether I come for free or I pay $10, $20, 200, whatever it is, um, uh, I want to at least be able to walk away with three things that I can apply into my business. And, um, it gives you the opportunity for people to just automatically assume yeah. That you're like an expert in your in your market, and as long as you follow that up with the right information, and people feel good about what they heard and yeah. can apply it, then um, that's important. Yeah, I I had a um, one of my uh, uh, pastors pass. He 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 said, "You don't have to know everything. You just have to know more than they do." Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, and and I knew that I wanted to be uh, I wanted to help business owners out, but obviously I'm only an expert in one specific area which is sales marketing and uh and putting events on but that's a big that's a big area (laughs) yeah that's yeah and um uh but i wasn't like an expert in finance and like all these other areas so i was like okay let's bring out different people to come in and speak and be able to add value back to these uh business owners and hopefully help them take their businesses to the next level most definitely. And she, she was saying something about connecting Atlanta and, and, and she, uh, maybe she was being humble about it, but they have, uh, you know, they have like almost 10,000 people in that group. It's 7,200. Yeah, 7,200. 7, that's, that's about 10,000. My mom used to say, uh, uh, anytime you spend over, uh, uh, 65, $70, it's a hundred dollars. <laughs> so, so she's in a roundup. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, but, uh, so yeah, but you, you, that's, uh, um, that's, um, great. And then, you know, you also do a lot of uh, work, even like outside volunteer work with various places and support. Talk a little bit about that. Okay. Well, uh, we have, I volunteered with a busy neighbor that was a while ago, but, uh, volunteered with them. Uh, Charmel, she's amazing. Uh, she had like kind of like connected businesses and stuff like that. Um, but what she does now is she does a lot of stuff for, uh, the vets and helps them with their mental health and provides recreational facilities and, and does events for them as well. Um, and then also the other one, uh, where I volunteered was with the Ahemza house and they're here in Atlanta. And it was a lady that, uh, herself was trying to get out of in a domestic violence situation and she had pets. So she realized that, uh, there's other women, uh, that may not leave a situation because of their animals. They know their animals will be abused. So what the Ahemza house does is they find foster homes for the pets so these women can go and get their lives together and get situated and get their pets back and that actually my um gracie that i have i got her i adopted her through there oh wow that's awesome yeah. that's awesome so, so who was who was who would be an ideal customer for you who was that customer that you say you know what this would be perfect for your business if a service provider, someone who is in finance, um, also real estate agents and anyone that offers a service back to business owners and is looking to drive and grow their brand and create um, lifelong customers and become a customer magnet themselves. OK, that's great. That's great. And um, Lee, do y'all um, you all are um, typically you always at an event doing something at an event. 
Yeah, we go to a lot of events. A lot of times we're invited to do radio at events. We're going tomorrow night to the WIT um, Woman of the Year event and broadcasting live from the Georgia Aquarium. So we're at events all the time. Yeah, that, Exciting. Yeah, most definitely. The, the, um, that really has an opportunity to get the brand out and people... Yeah, I mean, people, I mean, just just yesterday, a CMO of a very large company asked us to be part of an event at TAG next year. Um, we get constantly asked. I mean, being the media has its privileges, and a lot of events like to have an, a media element uh, to add kind of something different to the event and also to create a lot of content for the organizers of the event that can help them give the event legs beyond that day of the event. So you can do... Uh, interviews leading up to the event you can do interviews at the event and then you can do interviews after the event recapping the event so you can make the event last many days if you kind of plan your media correctly oh wow that's amazing and can i, can I say something? yeah go uh, for it go and for then it. if you utilize that um for also when you're doing events so a couple of things so kind of triggered what he was saying triggered in a good way and uh <laughs> is that um you have the opportunity uh when you are doing your events to also you can live stream them right so even mm -hmm. when you're doing your radio show for your own personal radio show or your event or both you can live stream that on social media uh linkedin facebook whatever and then you have your person edit it and cut it up and then you can create additional streams on social media so you can cut up your radio show, your video, whatever. And then what that does is that is an, an added way after the event is over with to help drive your brand even more and make it last. Cause now you aren't just a business expert, an expert leader at that event, but now you are continuously that, right? And so if other people want to either have you at their, have your radio show at their, uh, place of business, or if someone wanting to hire you, you have added content uh, that's going to be able to help drive who you are and get you know. Most definitely. What does somebody, what's an average like um, starting point? I mean, um, can they come to you saying, hey, look, I got $500. I need some help. Yeah. I mean, yeah, can I mean what? They what, just what won't is, get a lot of help. They won't get a lot of help, right? <laughs> no, that's, that's not true. <laughs> they can they can go to my website, standingroomevents plural dot com, standingroomevents dot com, and they'll be able to see my packages. But we actually do have a package on there that will give them a nice amount of help <laughs> um, for four ninety nine, and then we can put the event on for them, or we can do just their marketing for it, right, and drive their ideal avatar. Uh, to them yeah and that's one of the things i like that um with standing room events you can get it a la carte or you can get it as one package you know right. um because even from the point of developing an event you know branding the event developing the event um uh, putting the event on marketing for the event i mean that's a lot of work you know i put on events so i know how much work it is so if it's something where you can say hey i just want to show up you right. handle that <laughs> right and they have to be confident in knowing that if um, you know, if they're charging for it, great. They can get their money back that way or have vendors or, you know, whatever it is. But, um, uh, if they're not going to do that and they just want to speak from the event, just be co confident if you're going to pay someone like myself to know that you're going to be able to close at least a couple of accounts. You know, that's the biggest thing because you always want to make your money back somehow. That is correct. Now, it's not my responsibility to help them close. I can only provide them with everything that they need. But um, but they have to do uh, they have to do the job from the stand. But yeah, but just making sure that they have that on top of mind, um, um, you know, because that was something Kenneth was just talking about. It's just knowing uh, those things when they're going into whatever situation or deal. A lot of times it's just about knowing. Exactly. So um, so I'm going to ask you the same thing um, when you talk about uh, in your business or in your life, you know, the biggest mistake and then the, the, the biggest win or thing that you've seen at, in your company? The biggest mistake was doing <laughs> close to 70 events for free. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. Mm. Um, that was probably the biggest mistake. That was my biggest train. I, I did learn a lot, made a lot of great connections. It grew me for who I was. Um, but it wasn't a big revenue win 
for myself, um, which is fine because uh, your seeds will always come up in other areas. But um, I would say one of the biggest wins is um, uh, we did have a major event. We had over a hundred paid uh, individuals come out. I had three or four speakers come out and uh, we had it video recorded, just everything. And I still utilize that same content today right? With the different speakers and so forth, which is um pretty amazing. And we made money on that event. So that that's, was nice. That's great. I yeah. mean, because, you know, we had, uh, we had, I'm sorry, we had um, sponsors, we had um, uh, booths and stuff like that, tables that we sold. Most definitely. Because I mean, even what you were saying, you're still using that content. Now, one thing I like about uh, when I see uh, Gary Vanderchuk, he has one event and chops it up like 24 times in right. like 24 pieces of content. Right. And so I think, and he, you know, some of the stuff I'll still see, it'll be like 10 years ago and he'll drop it in something now, you know, just chopping mm-hmm. it up with new stuff. So I think that's good that you're not only talk, helping them to have events, but also to produce that content, which I right. think is, which I think is great. So where, where do you see, um, standing, uh, room events in, in, in the future? What does that look like? so uh that really uh so like so the next like couple of years i'd love to be able to have uh standing room events uh throughout uh in other areas uh in the united states probably like a couple of more states or more um and then I'd like to have somebody that is trained like myself to help consult and lead others in other states and also dr- bring business in as well. That's awesome. So yeah. how can people find out about you and get in touch with you? Standingroomevents.com, plural. Standing room events. Yep. It has my uh, phone number, uh, the way to email me and so forth. If they want to follow me on Instagram, I'm standing room events. <laughs> most definitely most definitely <laughs> well listen uh and i know there are some other things we'll, we'll leave that um for another time but i know you have some uh, other good things in place for the future and i'm excited and i'm excited for everybody that's uh come on i mean uh ken and lisa listen it was like you know we we're already through an hour plus and it just was bopping from one to the next so <laughs> <laughs> goes by fast it goes by mm-hmm. fast yeah so um if, po- if people want to learn more about this show and be a guest, how do they reach out to you, JR? Yeah, they can reach out to us. You can go to velocityradio.net or you can um, uh, head to uh, Business Radio X and you can go and see under one of the studios there. And uh, we're so excited um, to be a part of the Business Radio X family. And, and, and we're looking forward to doing many great things for many years to come. All right. Well, great first episode, JR. Thanks so much. All right. We'll see you next time on Velocity Radio.